I want to welcome everybody to Eagle Brook Church. My name is Ryan Lee, and I am the newest member of the Eagle Brook teaching team. Now, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I got an unexpected phone call from Bob in the summer. Uh, he said, hey, here are some things that we're, we're kind of thinking about. Would you come in September and just uh, spend a weekend with our church? And, uh, and I live in Dallas. And, and then Jason said, hey, would you consider you know, flying up here once a month and, and being a part uh, of our teaching team? I said, I'll come in the summer months, OK? <laughs> Just kidding. I, I agree to, to come, uh, you know, as, as, much as, uh, as much as he needed. And I, I just have to tell you, um, I am tremendously honored and humbled to be a part of what God is doing to Eagle Brook Church. I don't take this lightly at all. And I just see God doing so much with this community of faith. And um, it, it's an extreme privilege of mine to, to get to be a part of it. And so I'm excited to be on the journey. So you're going to see a little bit of chocolate, a little bit more than, than, <laughs> than you've uh, had in the past. And so I'm excited today uh, to continue this series called Didn't See It Coming. And I love this series because we all have things in life that, well, we, we just didn't see coming. Sometimes it was a breakup a divorce, layoffs at work, a car accident, something that drastically changes your career. And there is a man in the Old Testament, his name is Joseph. And Joseph had a lot of these things happen that he just didn't see coming. Uh, week one, we talked about the thing that he didn't see coming was betrayal. Joseph had this profound dream where he was large and in charge, specifically in charge of his brothers. His brothers did not like that, and so they sold him into slavery. Now, you might have a sibling that you don't really like, and you're like not looking forward to them coming over for Christmas, but you wouldn't sell them into slavery. Like That would be a stretch even for you and, and your sibling. Nevertheless, he didn't see that betrayal coming. He was just a young man dreaming. And the, the second thing that he didn't see coming was temptation. In fact, Genesis 39 says this about Joseph. It says, now Joseph was well built and handsome. Okay, Joseph, I see you. <laughs> I mean, just think about it. Like, if you're, if you're a guy here and you think, man, I'm pretty handsome, or maybe your mom told you that you were handsome, like, that's cool, you know? She might be right. She might be wrong. But when the Bible says you're well built and handsome, that's a sealed deal. You know what I mean? Like, there's no arguing here. And this well built and handsome man, he didn't see coming that his boss's wife would come on to him day after day. He didn't, he didn't see it coming. And, and when that story was over, now he ended up being put in jail. But when he got put in jail, he actually was then put in charge of jail. I, I mean, it, it, no matter what's happening in Joseph's life, God's favor is with him. And he keeps bringing him success, even in the worst of circumstances. And as he's in charge of jail, Pharaoh, the king, he has uh, two people that are working for him, a chief cupbearer and a chief baker. And they have wronged Pharaoh in some way. They, the Bible says that he, they have offended Pharaoh and they're put in jail. And the captain of the guard says, hey, all right, I want Joseph to take care of these prisoners. Now, they end up having this, this two wild dreams that they can't really understand. But Joseph, he has a particular gifting, a particular skill set in which he can actually interpret dreams. So the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, they share their dreams with Joseph, and Joseph begins to interpret them. The first dream he interprets goes like this. It says, this is what it means. Joseph said to him, the three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Now, this is how he does um, the, the second dream. This is what it means. Joseph said, the three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole. And the birds will eat away your flesh. Not going to go good for you, guy, okay? Like, I mean, he's going, it's bad news. And in fact, it's such bad news, I'm not even going to ask you for any favors because you won't be here in three days. So I'm just going to stick with the other guy and see if he can get me out of this prison. 
Now, th- this is how the story continues. It says, now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hands. But he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph has said to them in his interpretation. Now, here is the saddest verse in Joseph's life. I mean, when you get to this part, you're just going to go, how in the world did Joseph deal with this? He just didn't see this coming. And here's what it says. It says, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And the thing that often we don't see coming is our plans failing. And when we feel forgotten, the number one go-to move that we have is we say, all right, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Whenever we feel like God isn't working on our behalf and the timing that we would want him to do it, we say, okay, let me take the wheel. I'll be in charge now. What I found, what I find interesting about Joseph's life is that he was able to dodge the temptation of Potiphar's wife, but wasn't able to dodge the temptation of taking matters into his own hands. He has uh, gone from a pit to to slavery, and he's gone from slavery to being in charge of a very influential man's house, and now he's in charge of jail, but he's still in jail. So God keeps elevating him, but it's still not enough for Joseph. And now he's in a dungeon feeling forgotten. And when we feel forgotten, we go, all right, it's on me now. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you have overestimated your abilities to achieve something and you found out very quickly you were not as good at that thing that you thought you were good at? Um, I consider myself a a pretty good driver, not just a pretty good driver, an all-weather driver. It don't matter if it's a blizzard outside. If we're going somewhere, you want to ride with me, I'm going to get us there, okay? And now in college... Um, I lived in the Chicagoland area, and I went to college here in in Minneapolis, and so there was about a seven-hour drive whenever I would go back for holidays, and I didn't have my own vehicle, and so I would have to borrow different friends' vehicles. So sometimes if they had a nice SUV, that ride was cool. If they had a different car, it just depends on what kind of weather it was. Well, one Christmas break, it was a blizzard outside, and I said, I don't care. I got this, okay? Now, the, the car that I borrowed from a friend was a Ford Mustang, perfect for blizzards. And and then another friend said, hey, can I ride with you? Can you drop me off in Wisconsin? I said, I got this. Let's do this. Okay, so um, long story short, um, we ended up on reverse on I-94 with an 18-wheeler headed directly towards us. Obviously, I survived. I don't know why everyone's freaking out. So um, anyways, (laughs) but I I just, I thought, man, I, I got this. And how many times in our life do we think we got something and then it just... It doesn't work out that way. And we have uh, awesome friends and family that want to give us plan advice, especially when we're in a downtime. They go, hey, this is how you're going to get out. This is how you're going to get out of of, of your dark place. This is how you're going to to get out of this season where you just feel so forgotten. And what we often don't see is our plans not working out. When you're given advice on how to plan to get out of singleness, as if that's what is the goal, and when you think about uh, when you're single and the advice that you get, you got to get yourself out there. Come on, just put yourself out there a little bit more. Maybe hop on this app. Maybe start this online deal. Come on, come to this party with me. And, and if we sum up most of the dating advice that people receive, it's change yourself. Become somebody completely different, and then maybe you'll find the right one. But if I do that, I'll end up not being me Any more. When you're married, I can't tell you how many married couples I sit with, and this is, this is the statement I hear over and over again. Eventually, we'll figure it out. Will you? And if you could, wouldn't you have figured it out by now? Have you ever stopped long enough to ask yourself, what if we don't? What if we need an outside I mean, some, some of us say, man, I've got this plan to get ahead because somebody has forgotten me. Nobody can see me. You know what? I'm going to make myself be seen. I'm going to put together my own marketing plan. I'm going to show the world who I am. I'm going to get ahead at work. And if I can just work harder than everybody else and make sure that every influential person in my company can see what I'm up to and I'm going to post about it and I'm going to, I got a plan. Listen, here's the deal. There's, plans aren't bad. But they're just very flawed when we are the creators of them. I love what 
Proverbs 16, verse 9 says, it says, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. An old saying that I love is, if you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans. <laughs> I mean, just think about that for a second. Hey, God, guess what I'm up to? I got some ideas for you and for me. This is my life. And do you think that's kind of like backwards a little bit? Shouldn't we be going to God going, what's your plan for my life? What, what is it that you want to do? The best plan that you could have in the world is to include God in your plan. Uh, I, 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 I want to zoom in. I, I want to zoom in on something that, that Joseph said that really caught my attention. He says, I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. I have done nothing to deserve. I mean, I like Joseph. He, and in my mind, I'm going, dude, do you know what the Bible says about you? It says that you're well-built and handsome. The Bible doesn't say that about me. I mean, it, it says that you're successful. While you were in slavery, you were still successful. You're in Potiphar's house. You're owned by somebody else, but you're still successful. If you're in jail, you're, you're still in charge of jail. Like, Joseph, you kind of got it going on, to which Joseph would say to us, I'm still in jail. It's kind of like when somebody gets you a Christmas gift that you don't really like, and then they say it's the thought that counts, <laughs> but they got the wrong size, and you're like, it's the thought that counts. You could have thought about what size I actually wear. Now the gift you really got me is a trip to Target to take this thing back, okay? But I'm supposed to be like grateful for this. Or like, well, at least I got you a gift. You're like, I mean, kind of. <laughs> I mean, all of us have a dungeon. All of us have a disappointment that sometimes other people can't understand when you are fighting depression and you got a friend that comes along and, and says, dude, you got a pretty good life, man. You got a pretty good job. You, you've made more money this year than you've ever made in your life, man. You, you got a lot to be happy about, and you're just kind of looking back going, I mean, I guess I got some money in a dungeon. It doesn't, money doesn't make the dungeon any less dark. When um, you're in a, a marriage that's on the rocks, and uh, you're sitting next to your coworker who's divorced, and they're going, at least you're still married. You're going, married? in a dungeon, when you're very popular on social media and you've got more followers than all of your friends and everyone's going, man, you got it good. Look at everyone's liking your beach photo. Everyone is into your world. They love what you have for breakfast. This is awesome. And, and, and you're going, man, this is, everybody knows your name. Nobody knows your pain. And you're posting from a very, very dark place, popular in a dungeon. I can't tell you how many pastor friends I have. I can't tell you how many ministry volunteer friends I have that if they could, if you, we could pull the curtain up and see a little bit behind the scenes of their life, they are actually in a very, very dark place, yet they have signed up for a position that requires looking happy. Pastoring and serving in a dungeon. You know who gets it the worst? Stay-at-home moms. Oh, yeah. You see what a stay-at-home mom's like, oh, you got it good. Woo! You living a dream. You so lucky you get to stay at home with the kid, and you don't have to work. This is great. You're like, don't have to work? What? I haven't showered in three days, and I smell like goat milk. What are you talking about? And everyone thinks your life is a palace. But if they can see the real you, your parenting in a dungeon. We can't always understand each other's dungeons. What do you do when yours is, isn't understood? What do you do when no one can relate to your dungeon and you feel like you're just in a dark place? You're going to work in a dark place. You're in a relationship in a dark place. And Everyone else thinks you should be happy except you. What would you do if I told you 
that your prayer should not be for God to deliver you out of your darkness, to deliver you out of the dungeon. What would you do if I told you that you should simply just invite God to the dungeon? Right where you are. The worst thing that any of us can do is to make a plan to get ourselves out of our own dungeon. Uh, the worst thing that we can do is count on someone else to go, you know what, if I just meet this person, if I just get this job, if, if I could just get ahead, if I could just get this promotion, if I can just, if I can just, if I can just, if it's the worst place to be when you're in a dungeon. In fact, here's what I truly believe with all of my heart. A failed plan is one of life's greatest growth tools. The best thing that can happen to you is for that plan to fail. Why? Because then it's going to make you turn to God, where your attention was supposed to be all along. Now, I'm early in my 20s. I got to interview a guy who was very, very influential, and I thought, this is my shot. If I can just make an impression on this guy, I'm going to the next level. This is going to be great. And I knew I had a seven-minute interview with him live at a conference, and we kind of had a little bit of a pre-interview. He said, hey, man, what's your name? I said, my name's Ryan. Here's some of the stuff that I'm doing. He's like, oh, man, that's great. Super excited to be in this interview with you. And so I start the interview. I said, coming to you live with such and such. Man, and I asked him the first question, and he goes, Trevor, that's a great question. Now, let me tell you, and I, and I pretended to be Trevor for seven minutes. And I thought, how is he going to help me if he can't remember my name? Then I, I saw him about a year ago, and uh, things have kind of changed for me then, and, and, and so we're, we're just chatting, and he's like, man, tell me what you've been up to, and I, I'm telling him the, the deal, and, 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 and you know, he's giving me some advice, and it's cool, and, and then as he's leaving, he goes, Kevin, God's doing great things with you. You understand? I, I, I believe in you. All right. And I'm just going, this is so good for me. Why? Because my hope was never supposed to be in a man in the first place. Um, the, the reality is this. Is the, the good news is I have been looking for a mentor to show me the way in ministry and show me the way in business, and God volunteered and said, hey, have you ever thought about coming to me with that? I can help you, and I know people. <laughs> I got a few connections. But for some odd reason, we just kind of look to the left and to the right instead of looking up. Ladies and gentlemen, this is good news. At every location, every person that's watching, this is really, really good news for you. Why? Because you get to let that person off the hook. The person that broke up with you, the person that fired you, the person that forgot to call you back, the person that never responded to your email, the person that never put you in the game, you get to let them off the hook because what they did is they put you in a position to turn to your Savior, which is where your attention should have been in the first place. Thank God for them. A failed plan is so good for us. I love what Lamentations chapter 3 says. It says, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. I mean, on some level, we have to begin to ask ourselves, where is our hope? Is it in a thing? Is it in a, is it in a person? Is it in a future dream? Where where is, where is our hope? And, and here's the tension that we have to answer is how can we tell if, if your hope is in a plan or your hope is in God? Simple. Time and attention. How much time have you spent praying about your career? How much time have you spent praying about your relationships? How much time have you spent taking these things to God? It comes down to time and attention. I mean, uh, two-thirds of all marriages in 2019 um, were as a result of meeting online. So I never knock dating apps. I never knock online dating because that's, you know, about 66% of the way that it's going to happen in today's day and age. And so when people talk to me about dating apps, it's, it comes down there. Here's the line. It's one thing to, to have a dating app. There's another thing for the dating app to have you. When do you know that the dating app has you? When you start lying on your profile. 
When you start fudging things, when you start changing angles, and you're like, that ain't really you, and they're going to find out really fast. And, and when you start making adjustments to, you, to who, that's when you're going, that's on you. You're not trusting God with it. When you're on it for four hours at night, just swiping left and swiping right, it's, can you really say you have the app? When you're on Indeed.com and you're just going crazy with your resume and just trying to network like crazy. And this is a heart thing. This isn't an action thing. In your heart, you know, man, am I really trusting God? I love a St. Augustine. He said it like this. It brings a lot of balance to this tension. Pray as if everything depends on God. Work as if everything depends on you. This is the balance. It's going, you know what? I've got this dream I've got my hands on it. But you know what? I'm just going to pray about it. I'm just going to let go a little bit. I said, I want to make sure that God is in control in this situation. You know what? I, I, I want to get out of my dungeon too. But you know what? I have to begin to ask myself, how much time have I actually prayed about this versus come up with ways to get myself out of whatever I want to get out of? When we feel forgotten and we didn't see it coming, there's two things that I, I would recommend that you do. Number one, trust the process. Trust the process. Trust that God is up to something in your life. Here's what I know without a shadow of a doubt. We'll never regret waiting on God. I have never in my life heard anyone say, you know what, I was waiting on God and you know what, I regret it. I'm not going to do that ever again. Nobody says that. Why? Because when God does what God does, we all go, oh, I didn't know that. Like, like when you get broken up with, your heart is broken until about like two or three years later and you see them and then you're like, oh, that was God's grace on my life. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Oh. I didn't, I didn't see that. When you lose that job and, 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 and the business goes belly up, a couple years later, you're like, oh, I didn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't see it because hindsight's 2020. And guess who's got better perspective? God. So if you find yourself in a dark place, you find yourself in a dungeon and don't try and get out too fast because maybe God's up to something in the dungeon. And nobody else could understand it, but you decided to invite God to the dungeon instead of asking him to pull you out of it or coming up with your own plan. What do we do when things don't go according to our plans? We trust God to do for us what our plans never could. Can you imagine if God was your marketing plan? And I love marketing. I'm not against marketing. Love it. But what if we just trusted God with all of our elevation? To say, you know what? I might be working at a job that I cannot stand. But you know what? I'm going to be faithful right where I'm at. And I'm going to let God move the pieces in my life. I am not going to be the manipulator. I'm not going to be the puppeteer in this situation and try and maneuver things in a way that is beneficial for me. No, no, no. I'm just going to go, you know what, Lord? I'm going to have to trust that you're up to something, and my life is in your hands. When a man forgot Joseph, God remembered Joseph. Let's just say this cupbearer would have remembered Joseph. He may have gotten out of prison, but that's about it, because he wasn't going to be higher than the cupbearer. He wasn't going to have a position greater than him, but because God remembered him, he ended up being vice president of Egypt. We have to trust the process and go, Lord, I know that you're up to something. The second thing that I would encourage you to do when you feel forgotten is look for lonely people. Look for lonely people. God had many reasons for Joseph to be in a dungeon. Perhaps one of those reasons that perhaps he lost sight of in the midst of trying to get out himself was that maybe God had him in a dungeon so that everyone else in that prison could see what God could do 
with someone just like them. Because they're also in prison too going, we're here, we've, we've committed a crime. We actually deserve to be here. But now you got this guy Joseph in there with him going, God's on the move even with someone like me. You might be here today and go, Ryan, you don't know what I've done. Man, look at the story of Joseph. Look what God does with people that have even been in prison. God can show up wherever you are, no matter how dark the place is. And the best thing that we can do when we feel forgotten, the best thing that we can do when we feel overlooked and undervalued is to look for someone else that has gone through the same thing and see what we could do for them. You know, I, I, I love talking uh, with people about church, and sometimes um, you have those uh, church critics. They, uh, they're like professional church judges. I don't know how they got their job, but um, <laughs> they'll say, hey, you know, I went to church, and nobody said hi to me. I'm like, they didn't? Oh, man, I feel bad. And then somebody else will say, yeah, I went to the church, too, and nobody said hi to me. I'm thinking to myself, if y'all would have said hi to each other, <laughs> we would have solved the problem. Wow, think about that. I mean, just think about it. Isn't the onus on the place that we're going? You got you to gotta do this thing for me. But can you imagine if you just walked in and said, you know what? Hi. Imagine if you just looked at your neighbor on the right, looked at your neighbor on the left, and just said, hi. And they try. We would have solved the problem all together. But when we're the lonely person, we think someone needs to come save us. When the best thing that we could do is to go, you know what? I may not be the only lonely person in the room. And what would it look like for me to look to the left and look to the right and say, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. You're not alone. Here's what I believe. When you feel left out, unloved, undervalued, and forgotten, look for someone who might feel the same and include them, love them, value them, and remember them. I mean, who is that person that's on the outskirts of your world that maybe nobody ever gives any accolades to? Maybe it's a person that's on the media team at Eagle Brook Church. Because a guy like me on the stage could get an applause or, hey, good job, but what about the person that's just serving coffee? What about the person that is taking care of children while we're in here? I mean, just think about some people that maybe are forgotten in your world. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's an administrative assistant, or maybe it's the janitor. Or uh, Can you imagine if you just interrupted the janitor? You know, they put up the sign that says, hey, you can't come in this bathroom while we're cleaning. What if you just went in anyways and just said, thank you? They're like, what's going on? It's like, man, every now and then, I know you get paid to do what you do, but I see you. Because all of us have this desire in us to really be seen. Can you imagine what our world would look like if we were all people that had our heads on the swivel everywhere we went to say, you know what? Maybe there is somebody in the building. Maybe there is somebody here that needs to know that God has not forgotten them. And what if I was the person to deliver the message? I think about during this Christmas season where people can feel the loneliest and feel the most forgotten. And you know what I think? Thank God they live next to you. Thank God they work with you. Thank God they work out with you. Thank God they're in your class. Thank God they go to your church. Why? Because you're the person that says, you know what? I'm going to look for lonely people. Even when I'm in a dark place. I'm going to realize that maybe God has me right where I am for a reason. I would argue that maybe Joseph was able to be promoted and elevated to second in command of all of Egypt because he was faithful in a dungeon. <laughs> I love what the story says in Genesis 41 verse 1. It says, when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. Two full years. Years, 22 years since he had the original dream Joseph had where he was actually in charge. 22 years waiting on God. 22 years being faithful in slavery, being faithful in Potiphar's house, being faithful in a prison, and just going, God, I can't see what you're up to now. But once again, 
Two full years later, Joseph's going, oh, I can see it now. I got four questions for you that I want you to have over the holiday season. Four questions that you can discuss maybe at lunch today, at dinner tonight. I, 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 questions that I want you to if, be in a small group. If, if, you have, if you're not in one, I encourage you to join one because teaching comes to life when it's discussed. And, and here, here's a question that I want you to discuss, and it's this question. What plan should I loosen my grip on? What's the thing I'm going, nah, I got to make it happen. What, what's the thing that you just could just go, nah. I mean, I'll pray about it. I mean, I'm going to work hard, but my plan is not the plan. My plan is to surrender my plans to God, and then we'll let the chips fall. Second question is this, where is my hope found? I mean, if you could really be honest, if you could really take inventory of your heart and your soul and your mind, what are you banking on? Is it a thing? Is it an app? Is it a person? Is it an opportunity? Is it a dream? What, what's your hope in? Man, I'd encourage you to put your hope in God. Number three, who in my world might feel forgotten? Who's the person? Who's the person in my world? What student sits in the back of the class? What, who, who's, who's the single mom that maybe I just assume they're good, but maybe they're not? Number four, how could I show up for them better? What could I do this holiday season to show up for the person that maybe feels the most forgotten? Can you imagine what our world would look like if we were people that decided to say, you know what? Plans are plans. If they happen, they happen. If they don't, they don't. We're just going to trust that God has us wherever we are for a reason. And I'm not going to spend my time trying to control what I cannot control, but I will pray about all of that stuff and the things that God has given me. I'm going to be a good steward of it, even if it feels like a dark place and you're feeling like you're living in a dungeon. And while I'm there, I'm going to pause long enough to look around and say, you know what? Is there anybody else going through the same thing and what would it look like for us to lock arms to look each other in the eyes and go I see you I remember you thank you I value you I'm so glad that God put you in my world and you might be in a dungeon and I might be in a dungeon at the exact same time and what would it look like for us to join arms and say what if we invited God here to join us right where we are and at the end of our story, I got a feeling we'll all be going, oh, look what God has done in our life. When we didn't see that coming either. My hope and prayer this holiday season is that you would put your hope in God and that you would look for lonely people. God, I thank you so much for each and every person under the sound of my voice. I pray God that you would help us trust you with all of our heart. I pray, God, that our hope would not be found in a person. I pray that our hope would not be found in another plan. God, I pray that our plan would be to pray first and work hard second. And God, I pray this week that you would put people in our path that feel forgotten, that feel undervalued, that feel unseen, and God, I pray that you would give us the courage to take that as an opportunity to love them, to value them, and to truly remember them this holiday season. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Hey, join us next week for the last week of Didn't See It Coming. Happy holidays. It was great being with you.